right, Psalm 85. This morning, Psalm 85. Well, I was 40 when my son was born, so there we'll get the 40 in there. <laughs> uh, my wife and I have uh, one child. I was 40 when he was born, so we started with grandkids. He's now 20, and uh, and uh, so uh, he's uh, in college. And but it's good to be here. I'm looking forward to this. Ever since this was scheduled, and, uh, it's hard to believe it's uh, here. What a beautiful time here, gorgeous day, and uh, may the Lord breathe on us. I'm sure many of you pray leading up to a meeting like this. And let me thank you for doing that. It matters. Uh, you know, God said to Hezekiah, because you prayed, here's what I'm going to do. And so uh, it's, uh, it's uh, very uh, important. I trust that we'll keep praying and ask the Lord to just breathe on us in these days. You know, when there's that touch from heaven, what a difference. When it's not just going through motions, when it's not just ritual, but a genuine relationship with God himself, where God speaks and we respond. Uh, that's, uh, that's glorious. The God of the universe speaking to us. Uh, and uh, he knows us by name. He knows you by name. He loves you with a perfect love. And he has perfect wisdom about everything going on in your life. He has perfect power to carry it out. That is our God. And so may the Lord bring on us in these special days together. So Psalm 85, uh, as you've noticed in your bulletin, this says a prayer for revival Bible conference. This is a prayer for revival. This entire psalm is. It's an amazing psalm. Uh, we're going to focus in on one verse, really one word, in the time that we have this morning. So Psalm 85, verse 6, the psalmist cries out, Wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? Now notice here, it's that God's people might get their focus back on God and rejoice in him. It's not a matter of rejoicing in, in, in it. Yet, though we're thankful for all that God does, but him. That's fascinating. When there's genuine revival, you get caught up with God, with who Amen. God is. And so that's, uh, that's where he's headed here. But he says, will you not revive us, us, us again? And so uh, may the Lord uh, speak to our hearts. By the way, in this psalm, he receives the answer from the Lord in verse 12. Yes, it's that word, yea. Yes, the Lord shall give that which is good. Isn't that interesting? He asked the question earlier on. He gets the answer. And so uh, I want to ho uh, focus in on that word revive. And so I want to speak this morning on life again. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you breathe on us in that very special way where we know that we're meeting with you. Lord, that you'd quicken our hearts and our spirits and our minds and our bodies to receive all that you have for us. And Lord, that you would nurture faith and a faith response that we would look to you to move once again in our hearts and in our lives and in our church, in our churches, Lord, in our day. So, Lord, I plead the blood of Jesus. Protect us from the attack of the enemy. And, Lord, breathe on us now. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. A number of times over the last, especially 20, 25 years, I've had several people come to me with a statement that's essentially the same. It's, uh, it's worded slightly different sometimes, but it's the same thing. They'll say things like this, you know, <laughs> you're just almost like getting saved again. And they say it just like that. <laughs> what are they talking about? You can't get saved again because if you receive eternal life, that life is eternal and you cannot have eternal life for just a little while. <laughs> it is eternal. But they're talking about something that is like getting saved again. They're talking about re-life. They're talking about revival or life again. Now, what are we talking about? By the way, when does this end? I should have asked you that earlier. Oh, uh, 10.30, 10.35. Okay, 10.30, 10.35. All right, good, good. Uh, we got plenty of time. Uh, I got to make sure I finish on time because I don't want to cut into the time of the morning preacher, <laughs> since that's me. <laughs> so that's one way to get one way to get a guy to finish on time. Uh, schedule him after himself. But uh, at any rate, uh, back at the turn of the century, there was a uh, an event in Canada known as the Laughing Revival. Did anybody ever hear of the Laughing Revival? All right, a few of you have, and it uh, <clears throat> was called that because the audience would laugh. Now, there's a time to laugh. There's a time, obviously, for joy. Uh, but this got a little interesting because there were times when the, uh, the preacher would be preaching, for example, on the subject of hell, very difficult subject, and the audience would break out in hysterical laughter. Now, is there something wrong with that? Yeah, there's something wrong with that. Now, we would call that counterfeit. 
Now let me just say, you cannot have a counterfeit unless there first of all was the real. See, what happens in the broader scale of Christianity, which is a big umbrella of uh, people that actually put their faith in Jesus and are saved, uh, sometimes you have settings that, uh, that might be more shallow. For whatever reason, there's not a lot of deep grounding in the truth. Uh, but you have people that are saved. Uh, but along the way, as people uh, begin to grow, some of them recognize, you know, there's got to be more to it. There's got to be more than just the shallow uh, setting that they're in. And so uh, they begin to cry out to God. And you know what? God hears their cry. God begins to move. God begins to breathe. But then Satan, he hates revival because people surge forward in times of revival. And so he throws in his counterfeit. If people are undiscerning because of a lack of grounding in truth, then, uh, then they embrace the counterfeit. When that happens, that grieves the spirit. And what you're left with is either dual streams or often the strange fire that begins to take over. But you had real fire to begin with. We need to know that. But even in the ranks of uh, the churches that we're used to, churches that, uh, that seem to have a little bit more emphasis on doctrine and grounding, I still find that there's confusion on the word revival. It's fascinating to me. Fascinating. Uh, I've been in meetings on a number of occasions when maybe I'm out in the community with uh, the pastor or someone in the church at a restaurant or something or uh, whatever the case, and they're talking to someone and they'll, they'll say, hey, we're having revival this week. Now, what they mean is we're having a meeting this week. Now, it is possible for revival to break out in a meeting. I've seen God do it and bless the Lord. But I think it's uh, important to say that it's possible to have a meeting and not have revival. <laughs> I've seen that too. So, uh, now it's legitimate to use the terminology a revival meeting. That means you're having a meeting where you're seeking the Lord for revival. But to use the, the term synonymously does confuse our understanding. I passed by a church uh, sign at <laughs> one time, and it had a, uh, uh, the date of a Sunday coming up, and it said, one day revival. So obviously they were confused in a special day, which is a legitimate thing, with the concept of revival itself. I was in a meeting one time where uh, the pastor got up uh, on the second to the last night of the meeting and said, now the revival ends tomorrow night, which cracked me up. But at any rate, what he meant was the, the meeting ends tomorrow night. And so what's happened is we still use these terms sometimes in a, in a broader sense than they really are and it confuses us now what is revival how would you know if you were in revival how would you know if the church was or a broader region well in the scripture there are some phases that lead up to revival i'm going to mention these very briefly it's not our focus this morning we're going to focus on the last phase but just so we can distinguish between revival and what leads up to it in the broader sense of the term especially uh, these phases come into play uh, but the first phase is what i like to title there must be more it's when an individual or individuals recognize you know what we're saved we're on our way to heaven praise the lord for that but there's got to be more and that statement is all over the history books Jonathan Goforth and the revival in his life that led to the Manchurian revival. Uh, you have this phrase, there, 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 there was, he goes, I knew there was something more. And so that's where it starts. It gets people on a journey. They get to, get to hunger and it's an awakening to need. There must be more. More could be said. That brings you to phase two, which I call seeking God's reviving presence. When those who are awakened that there's more, they begin to seek the Lord. And you know, the Bible says, if you seek him, he will be found of you. Return unto me and I will return unto you. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you over and over again throughout the word of God. Old and New Testament, uh, different terminologies, but same truth. When you seek the Lord, he will be found of you because God prefers to revive rather than to judge. That's a marvelous truth. Seeking God's reviving presence, that brings you to phase three. I like to title this phase, God has come. I take those three words right out of the history books because a number of times uh, over the centuries and different continents, when there is a greater moving of the spirit in what we call revival in the bigger sense, uh, people will say, God has come. God is here. Uh, or God stepped down from heaven. That was the words of the Scottish. 
in the Lewis Revival. But these kinds of phrases, it's man's attempt to describe God in the atmosphere. In other words, there is a difference between God's omnipresence, his everywhere presence, and his manifest presence. You know, right now in the greater Akron area, there are thousands of people who at this moment are not aware of God's presence, even though he's everywhere present. They are not conscious of God. God is not in their thoughts. But do you know if God were to move in the way that we're talking about, in fact, the Bible terminology is God pouring out his spirit, which is defined in Ezekiel 39, 29, as God manifesting his presence, not physically, but spiritually. And just as real as if it were a physical manifestation, there's an awareness of God. And if God were to pour out his spirit on the greater Akron area right now, then what would happen is every human being, saved or lost, would become conscious and aware of the presence of God. Now, friends, America needs that. Your town needs that. Amen. Our churches need this. That awareness of the presence of God. Now, it's seasonal, according to Acts. The times are seasons of refreshing from the presence of the Lord in this bigger sense uh, because uh, uh, it's the reign of the Spirit and so it's seasonal because you've got to have it stop a bit so that you can bring in the harvest and then you have another season. Maybe we'll talk about some of that this afternoon. We'll see. But the point is, it's God in the atmosphere. In other words, the filling of the Spirit is when God fills you with His life. That would be personal revival. The outpouring of the Spirit is when God fills the atmosphere with His life. That would be corporate. By the way, have you not been in services where there is an intense awareness of God? In other words, where there's a holy hush that comes over. Now, it can be deeper in its level of intensity. It can get really deep, uh, maybe than what you've experienced. Uh, it can be uh, extended in its breadth of geography and as well as its duration of time. Sometimes it's like a one service thing. Sometimes it's days. Sometimes it's weeks. Uh, but all of this is this presence of God manifest. Much more could be said. That brings you to phase four, brokenness. The way into blessing. You know, when you see God for who he is, you see sin for what it is. Isn't it amazing what we can rationalize? We get desensitized. But you know, when you see God, when God's presence is felt, all of a sudden sin is sinful. And you either get right with God or you run. There's no mediocre when God moves on the level that we're talking about. It's either Acts 2, 3,000 get saved, or it's Acts 7, and they throw rocks. <laughs> it's one or the other. And so, uh, but brokenness, when there's God in the room, uh, this is what brings people to their knees for the lost and salvation, for the saved and getting right with God or revival. And that brings us to phase five, which is where we're going to spend the rest of our time this morning, life again. Now, what is revival? How would you know if it occurred? individually or in this broader sense, corporately. Let me give three defining issues in the time that we have. First of all, the defining essence of revival is a restoration to spiritual life. The defining essence, that's a key word, essential. Essence of revival is a restoration to spiritual life. Now we'll come back to that. Let's start with the word essence. We're dealing with what revival is, what's essential versus what revival does. That's what's incidental. In other words, there are many incidents in revival, things that happen, things that God does, but they may not happen like that in every revival. Those are the incidentals. They're wonderful because they're the wonderful works of God, uh, but they're not essential in that they may change from revival to revival. What we're talking about then with definition is what's essential. In other words, we need to know the difference between what revival is and what revival does. Because if you define revival by what it does which is what many definitions are, and that means they're not definitions, they're descriptions. If you define revival by what it does rather than what it is, then you can end up with a self-effort works temp attempt to get there. That's imitation, it's not the same. Just as if you define, define Christianity by what it does rather than what it is, you end up with a self-effort attempt to get there, that's the religions of the world. And so it's vital that we understand what revival is rather than what it does because it can get really confusion if you, uh, confusing if you don't. I've heard people say, well, <laughs> when real revival comes, it's going to go coast to coast. 
Well, what if you're in a nation that doesn't have two coasts? Or when real revival comes, it's going to shut down all the bars in the community. That's happened many times. That's phenomenal. But what if you're in a community in Alabama that doesn't have bars? I'm told there's a few left. <laughs> you see, that's confusing what revival may do in a given scenario versus what revival is in every scenario. So we're talking about what it is. Now, our text is Old Testament. That means the, uh, the language underneath this is Hebrew. Uh, Hebrew verbs have three letters. Isn't that weird? Every verb has three letters. <laughs> it's fascinating. And uh, uh, the, the verb, stem here, is used throughout the Old Testament, uh, uh, most often meaning to live or to have life. Here we have a slight change in what's happening, and it means to live again, <laughs> to be restored back to life. Whether it's emotional life in the sense of uh, uh, Jacob when he realized Joseph was alive and it says his spirit revived, same word. Or whether it is physical life being restored, as when the widow's son died and Elijah prayed for him and he, the boy, revived, 1 Kings 17, or whether it is spiritual life, as we have right here in this text, as well as the word quicken in Psalm 119, same word, as well as the word revive in Habakkuk 3.2, uh, 3, revive thy work, O Lord. Okay, that's our word here. That's the spiritual sense. Now, there are other words that parallel the other phases. But when it comes to phase five, this is the word. Now, when you move into the New Testament, obviously you move from Hebrew to Greek, and there is a, a, a Greek word that has two words put together. And it's a compound. Uh, so one of them means to live, the other one means again. So there it is, to live again. For example, that is used in Luke 15 in the parable of the prodigal son. And though we can apply that to lost people getting saved, may I remind us the son is a son. The father is the father. To, to get to very precise, what you have here is the picture of, 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 of a son, a, a saved person who's estranged from the father. The heavenly father would be the, the greater picture. But there in the parable, uh, there's the son. He's estranged from his father. You remember, he, uh, he takes his inheritance. Now, we all have the inheritance of the spirit. But he wastes his inheritance. It's a sad story. As the story goes on, there's a famine in the land. He runs out of food. Now he's desperate. He's so desperate, he gets a job feeding pigs. That's pretty difficult for a Jew who can't eat pork. <laughs> and the Bible says, and he came to himself. And he remembered, you know, back at my father's house, the servants have food enough and to spare. You know what that is? There must be more. Phase one. He says, I will arise and go, and he plans a speech, and he goes. There's phase two, seeking the Father. Well, what about phase three? What about God has come? I love the story. You remember it. The Father's looking for him. He sees him coming from far off, and he runs to meet him. You see, when you take one step toward God, God runs to meet you because he prefers to revive rather than to judge. And that's when the father falls on his son's neck. That is the wording that's used in the book of Acts of the Holy Spirit falling on people. See, there's the meeting with God. There's the outpouring of the Spirit. There's the God has come concept. Well, what about brokenness? Here's how we know he was broken. He only gave part of a speech. His planned speech was to say, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I'm no more worthy to be called your son, so make me as one of your hired servants. In other words, so my needs can be met. It was a confession of need. But when he gets there, he only gives the first part of the speech. Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I am no more worthy to be called your son. And he stops. Now, it's a confession of sin. It goes deeper. He's broken. Well, what about the last phase, revival? Well, you remember what the father said in Luke 15, 24. He said, for this my son was dead. Now, let me ask you, was he dead physically? No. So we're talking about something spiritual. For this my son was dead and is alive again. There's our word. Life again. Alive again. Now, most of us don't speak Hebrew or Greek. Not even most preachers. We just say it here and then to make you think we're smart. But uh, uh, at any rate, <laughs> we, uh, we use English. So let's talk about the English word here for a second because 
Uh, Noah Webster, in the first edition to the American Dictionary of the English Language, the first publication was 1828. You need to know that America was in the Second Great Awakening. It had already been rolling for over 25 years. It was one of the longest rev revivals that America has ever known. Uh, it was a powerful revival. Uh, East, uh, New England, Eastern Seaboard, into the Western states, which were in those days was Kentucky and Tennessee. Uh, but nonetheless, got on the move. And when Webster wrote this, he was... He was good friends with Azahel Nettleton, one of the evangelists in New England. Revival had been occurring for over a quarter of a century. He's not creating definitions. He's writing definitions based on how Americans were using words. So this is very significant. And uh, I'll give you his definitions both from the physical sense as well as the spiritual sense for, uh, by, by way of comparison. These guys were verbose, so I'll just give you the highlights. In the physical sense, for the verb, he says, to return to life, to recover life. So the emphasis is on life. And he puts a Bible verse in the dictionary to illustrate it, 1 Kings 17, about the widow's son being revived. Then we come to the spiritual sense, and he says, to bring again to life. Then he uses a word that's helpful to us, to reanimate. Then our text is in the dictionary as the illustration. Wilt thou not revive us again? That thy people may rejoice in thee. Then he has closely related words like revivicate and revivification. And I want you to know I had to practice to be able to say those words. <laughs> and I'm glad those words don't get used anymore. And then we have the, uh, the participle. His, his definition is beautiful here. For the word reviving, it's simply bringing to life again. Now, I've been intentionally redundant. Re means again, vibe means life. That's what it means. Again life. Life again. So let's chew on this. That means physically, revival is a restoration to physical life. So help me out here. That means spiritually, revival is a restoration to spiritual life. Now, what life is that? Well, let's use the words of John 3.16. You believe on Jesus, you should not perish, but have... That's the life we're talking about. Did you know that everlasting life is not just something, it's someone? Because 1 John 1, 2 says Jesus is that eternal life. 1 John 5, 20, the Lord Jesus Christ, this is the true God and eternal life. That's the life we're talking about. The life that moved in when you were born again. That eternal life accessed as the abundant life. See, that's the reanimation. That's the life again that we are talking about. Therefore, revival is not seeking something. Revival is seeking someone. Amen. Whether it's that life again in you, that's the filling of the Spirit, where the Spirit fills you with the life of Jesus, or whether it is that outpouring of the Spirit, where God fills the atmosphere with His life. In both cases, you're dealing with His life. It's seeking someone. You see, experiencing revival is experiencing God. It's experiencing Jesus. We need to know that. Why? Because Christianity is essentially a life. The Christian life is not a set of doctrines merely or a set of moral actions. Unsaved moralists have that. The Christian life is a life, a person. His name is Jesus. Jesus Christ is the Christian life himself which means no one can live the christian life but christ but here's the good news when you got born again christ the christian life himself moved in Amen. to live his life not yours <laughs> and friends when we haven't been living his life when we've been living our own and you save your life you lose it in other words it's no longer animated by him that's not going to do well at the judgment seat though you're saved ah but when you access him yeah, that's what passes the test at the judgment seat. That's the gold, silver, and precious stones. The not I, but Christ's life. That's the life that we're talking about. So, the first truth here is the defining essence of revival is a restoration to spiritual life. God's life in you, God's life in the atmosphere, His life. Secondly, the defining evidence of revival is a restoration to spiritual living. If the essence is a restoration to spiritual life, the evidence is a restoration to the spiritual living out of that life. So now we do move from what revival is to what revival does. Now, 
On the individual level, the old writers had a phrase that combines the two points together. And they would call it, they would say it this way, the spiritual life, that's the essence for holiness and service. That's the living out of that life or the evidence. But I have found that there's a lot of confusion on the term holiness. And I lived in that confusion for years. We tend to define it by a certain set of outward actions. That may or may not be holy. Because unsaved moralists can imitate outward actions. Wow. And if they don't have the holy one in them, it's not holiness. It's unholy, unholy self-righteous religious rags. You see, true holiness is when you access the Holy One in you so that it's not I but Christ so that the Spirit is filling you with that life of Jesus and the Spirit, ah, oh, the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the Holy Spirit is love. Why? Because God is love. Manifest is joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. All right, temperance will mean some outward things are affected, but it's one little slice. Because true holiness is Jesus in you manifested through you. The beauty of holiness is the beauty of Jesus. When he is seen in your eyes and heard in your voice, that's true holiness. Wow. Wow. You see, it's the person of holiness, the essence of revival, living through you, that holy living, because he's holy. There's your evidence. But holiness is just a part of it. Then there's service. But again, it's not just going through the outward motions of service. All across the country today, churches are going to be doing all sorts of acts of service. Some will be uh, animated by God. Some won't be. So again, it's not just the imitation of motions. It's when it's Jesus, not just in you, to you, but through you, out to others. Ha, ah, that's when it's real service. When the person of service, the essence of revival, is animating you. There's the evidence. That's what we're talking about. When that's the case, Jesus loves people. He died for them. And that's when your evangelism gets kicked in. Your unashamedness of Jesus, your witness with power. And it happens in revival. It just does because of what we're talking about. Now, all of that is coming back to normal. Fascinating. I was in Canada one time, passed by an auto mechanic's garage, and it said auto revival. Now, that was the first time I ever heard the, saw the word revival connected to a car. But you know, some cars do need revival. <laughs> Maybe yours does, so after the service today, we'll have a special laying on of hands. No, not really. Uh, but uh, now, what did he mean? He didn't mean bring your car to me, and when I'm done with it, it'll be a souped-up car. He just means I'll bring it back to normal working condition. That's what we're talking about, coming back to normal. You know, when somebody's been physically alive, let's say something happens, they, they almost drown, and somebody respirates them. They do not become superhuman. They come back to normal. And what we're talking about with this restoration to spiritual life and the living out of that life is coming back to normal New Testament book of Acts Christianity. And that brings us to the third issue here. The defining extent of revival is the realm of influence. The defining extent of revival is the realm of influence. For example, we could talk about, can talk about personal revival. I remember 20-some years ago, I was talking to a, an evangelist, and he said, John, I'm 53. He said, you know, I used to think that, it, you know, every Christian just had to have certain besetting sins, that that's just the way it is. By the way, if that's what you think, then that's what you have, because you're giving the ground. But he smiled. He said, but i got to tell you. He said, I've been reading books on the Spirit for Life by authors like Andrew Murray and others. And he said, he said, I'm almost afraid to say this. He looks around. <laughs> he said, but I've experienced victory over certain sins for the last six months. He said, I didn't even know that was possible, the sight of heaven. And hallelujah. He was in revival. He was accessing the Holy One. Jesus was animating him. And Jesus didn't have those bad habits. <laughs> wow. 
It's a personal revival. How about small group revival? Where it's more than one, it's two or three, maybe five or six, maybe up to 11 or 12, a small group. By the way, it's the personal revivals and the small group revivals that form the intercessors for the larger revivals. In the big revivals, tons of people get blessed, but they don't know why it happened. But the intercessors are never surprised. And it's the personal revivals and the uh, small group revivals that form the intercessors. But yes, there can be a small group revival. I was in a meeting one time in the Philippines uh, in a church there, and God moved. The church was a large church, seven, 800 people. The whole church did not experience revival. About 25 did. In an after meeting, which is a meeting after the meeting. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to tell you, God came to that after meeting. And the next night, and the next night, and the next night, I mean God came. You know, God's presence was so real, we got down on the floor. And there's nothing weird about that. You read it in the Bible. When they were in the presence of God, what did they do? They got down and they took their shoes off. <laughs> and we were in this building that had a cement floor, and it was dusty and so forth. But it didn't matter. It didn't matter. You got down and your buttons were in the way. God was in the room. And I'm going to tell you, God moved. Those dear Filipinos came, come and clean with God. Everybody come and clean with God. All of us come and clean with God. And after several nights, they were cleaned up. Then they got on fire. They began to pray for souls. Now, we didn't know it till later, but they had not had a gospel service, a service for the purpose of seeing people saved. They had not had one for over a generation. They were living off the past. It's an amazing story. And that next week we had some gospel services, not knowing they hadn't had one for decades. And I'm going to tell you, God began to move. People began to get saved. Last night, 30 got saved. Well, that, that prayer group, the revived group, the small group revival group, they kept praying for the next number of months. Do you know that six months later they had a special emphasis uh, a week and they saw 450 professions of faith in one week because of a small group revival? Fascinating. I wonder what would happen here. But let's go bigger. Sometimes there's a church-wide revival. Maybe not every individual. Some people can resist. It's not automatic. But maybe the majority. I've seen this happen. Oh, my. Oh, when God breathes on a church. Ah, oh, first time I saw it uh, I was actually in West Virginia. I'll never forget. It was early, uh, early 90s. Uh, not too far from here, really. Uh, Fairmont. Uh, what, a, what a special time. God did it in 93. did it again in 95. We had a meeting went two and a half weeks because God came down. It was, it was marvelous. It was, it was, it's it's life-changing. I saw God do it in Ireland in the year 2000. I was not the intercessor, but I was there. I got to watch what God did. Oh, wow. I mean, we had meetings after the meetings. They lasted longer than the meetings. We would dismiss at midnight. Nobody wanted to go home. Wow, European culture. Amazing. But, you know, uh, that's real. That can happen. But let's go further because we need the revival to go beyond our walls. How about a community-wide revival? Where it's not just the church, a church, it's a whole community. And whatever churches have a heart for God, they all get blessed, even the ones that have a different label. <laughs> if they've got a heart for God, God will bless them. <laughs> and uh, God begins to move, begins to move. You know, this happened in DeBarton, West Virginia. March to May, 2016. How many of you are aware of that revival? All right. What a move of God. <laughs> it affected two counties. Two counties. And you know, I read a, an article in the paper, one of the pastors saying that when you go to the restaurant in one of the towns, uh, he said, you, the, the conversations you overhear are about God. Amen. Now we're used to hearing about politics or sports or climate change. So called, uh, but uh, the, but can you imagine if the over, you know the conversations we overheard were about God? See, that's what happens. That's community wide. Let's go further. How about a regional revival, where a number of communities in a given region experience a move of God? God did this beginning in Sandy Creek, North Carolina, back uh, in the late 1700s, God began to move, and that little 
basically two roads crossing, not even much of a town, began to experience the move of God. The church grew to several hundreds, and uh, so they started another church, and finally one was about 900, one was about 500 before modern transportation. This is amazing. Sandy Creek, North Carolina. Do you know in the next 50 years, those firebrands began to spread into uh, South Virginia, uh, South Carolina, Northern Georgia, East Tennessee, and within 50 years of the Sandy Creek Revival, 1,000 churches were started. It's one of the major contributing factors for the Bible Belt being the Bible Belt. See, that was a regional revival. How about national? Can that happen? Yes. God's done it here. How about 1906? When God moved in the USA, God was moving all over the world, but he moved in the USA and uh, Atlanta and uh, Denver. Uh, they were shutting down all the stores on, on the, the, the day of prayer so everybody could go. Can you imagine? He got on the move. You know, God, by the way, moved in other times, many other times. Maybe we'll touch some of that at another uh, time. But regional. National, and then there can be international. Do you know from 1901 to 1913, 57 nations saw revival? At least. Wales, India, oh man, uh, with uh, John Hyde and Amy Carmichael. Uh, the revival in India was so powerful. Uh, Korea, 1907. It's amazing. By the way, the center of the revival is now the capital of North Korea. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> Uh, but God moved there. My point is this, whether it's one person or 57 nations, it's the same dynamic. It's restoration to the life of God. And so, let's join in this prayer for revival that the psalmist prayed, Wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee. Lord, bless your truth to our hearts in a faith-building way. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thank you, Pastor.